greetings and salutations, and welcome to the season of Lent. During this season, we will be gathering virtually, and on Wednesday evenings, we'll be singing Holden Evening Prayer, and in the middle of the Holden Liturgy, we will be listening to a teaching given to us by Dr. Kelly Murphy of CMU. Um, Dr. Murphy is an Old Testament scholar, and she is going to be giving us weekly lectures around the afterlife. This program is called Afterlife, the Eternal Journey, and Dr. Murphy is going to take us through a number of the teachings that scripture has regarding the afterlife, mortality, um, heaven and hell, all of these things which, especially during Lent, as we mark our foreheads with ashes and think about what it means to be human, um, ring very true and are very important to us. So I hope that this is something that you will utilize week after week for song and prayer and for learning. We will begin our Holden evening prayer. I am joined by Stacy Beebe, who is our cantor. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine.
come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Amen. I ask that you open your hearts and your ears to the teaching which we are going to learn this day, and may the Spirit of God inspire you in all that you learn. Welcome to Welcome to our fifth and final video in our series, Afterlife, The Eternal Journey. Here in this video, after spending a fair amount of time thinking about hell, we finally turn to the concept of heaven, and especially to the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God as it appears in the New Testament texts. As we'll see, heaven and the kingdom of heaven are closely connected with the ways that early Christians carried hope not just hope for the afterworld, not just hope for eternity, but also hope for this earthly and mundane existence. To begin, I want to briefly think about what the kingdom of heaven might have meant when early Christians were talking about it and how it's talked about in the New Testament. And then we'll move to the way that it is depicted as both here already and yet somehow a future event. And finally, we'll come back and think about the ways that the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God was sort of deliciously subversive um, and was a really interesting choice for the uh, early Christian writers to use in the face of um, being a part of the greater Roman Empire. So first, kingdom of heaven. This is an image from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 13, um, in which Matthew has Jesus um, giving a series of parables that explain what the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, and the kingdom of heaven in this particular uh, passage from the New Testament, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, a mustard seed is a tiny little seed. And the first century folks who were hearing this text read aloud would have known that a mustard seed does not grow into the greatest of shrubs, and it certainly doesn't become a tree. Um, and so what's going on in this odd reference, this odd comparison between the kingdom of heaven and a mustard seed? What we see here is a sort of recognition that as Jesus is going around and preaching about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God um, across Galilee and across ancient Israel, he is doing so in the context of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Romans control the land of ancient Israel at this point, and uh, the people who live there are sort of small and insignificant, at least when one thinks about the larger empire and everything that is happening. They're certainly small and insignificant for the Romans um, in any case. And so uh, there's sort of an acknowledgement here of this idea that um, even though Jesus might be and his ministry might be considered insignificant by the larger emperor empire that, that they live in, nevertheless, it's incredibly important. And it is, in fact, going to grow quite big. Um, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew usually talks about the kingdom of heaven. 
some of the other gospels, including Mark and Luke, talk about the kingdom of God. So there's the gospel of John. Um, they seem to be using these phrases as parallels or um, analogously. And we know this because when Mark tells the parable of the mustard seed, um, he talks about how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, whereas Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. By the time we get to the Gospel of John, we see an emphasis on the kingdom of God and a connection between the kingdom of God and the concept of everlasting life. So, for example, in John 6, 40, we read, This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Now, next, if we go to... 1 Corinthians 15, um, which is uh, from one of Paul's letters, we get a glimpse into the way that um, early Christians were connecting the um, kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of God, with the resurrection of believers in Jesus. Uh, to take a step back, um, and look at some of the New Testament writings more broadly and not just at Paul, it's important to note that there is a sort of apocalyptic tenor throughout the message of Jesus and his earliest followers, um, especially as it relates to the coming kingdom of God. They speak and write as if the uh, coming kingdom of God is going to happen soon or perhaps has already happened. For example, in Mark 1, 14 through 15, Jesus says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, or maybe in the Greek, it would be better to say is at hand, repent and believe in the good news. Uh, this is tied in part um, to the fact that the resurrection event and then the promise that Jesus would return later to establish this kingdom was one of the ways that early Christians made sense of their identification of Jesus as the Messiah, as the heir to the Davidic throne, but Jesus's lack of establishing an actual kingdom, which is what most early Jews expected to happen here on this earth um, and taking back the land of Israel from, at that time, the Roman conquerors. So if we go and look at the New Testament, we see that it contains an array of texts that discuss this idea of kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. And sometimes it talks about the kingdom of God as if it's already here. And at other times, these texts talk about the kingdom of God as a future eschatological event or reality, as something that's going to happen at the end times. It's going to break into this world and sort of radically change everything that we know. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, Jesus is asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he replies, the kingdom of God is not coming with the things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. That's how it's usually translated in the NRSV, but a better translation might be, the kingdom of God is within you. And so in this text, we have uh, Jesus saying that the kingdom of God is already here. But there are also places where we see it um, referred to as in something that is coming, something that is not yet here. In the opening chapter of Mark, Mark 1, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaimed the good news of God, and says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. It is at hand, um, like we saw. Or famously, uh, most of us know this one, the idea that it might come in the future is seen in the gospel's renditions of the Lord's prayer. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there we see this idea of God's kingdom as something that is going to come in the future. If we come back to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, we're reminded that Paul, um, thought that Jesus, believed that Jesus was sort of the, uh, was the answer, was the fulfillment of the Davidic promise, the promise that David, an heir of David, would rule over ancient Israel. But when and how um, Paul identifies Jesus as the risen Messiah, the risen Christ, uh, Paul believes that Jesus will return in a second coming. And at that point, will raise the dead. History will end as we know it. Evil will be defeated. Um, and God's kingdom will be established on earth. 
and key to this hope was the idea of resurrection. Not only Jesus' resurrection, which had already happened, but now also the early Christians, their resurrection in the future, the resurrection of all believers. And the promise of Jesus' bodily resurrection uh, is important because it shows that he has defeated death, but not death, just death. He also defeated the Romans because remember, he was executed by the occupying Roman government, but by resurrection and then his second coming, he has defeated not only death, but also the Romans who thought that they had successfully executed Jesus. Um, and in this way, Paul talks about how uh, Jesus's followers who would be resurrected at the end times would too, would also defeat death. So what does this all mean? Well, finally, the kingdom language. This is really, really important. important. Um, what you see here is an image from the Cloisters Apocalypse. It's in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art now, I believe. It's from about the 1300, uh, the year 1330 of the Common Era. And these are people who are worshiping the beast that came out of the sea in Revelation 13. And what's happening here, why it's so interesting, is that most scholars identify the seven-headed beast that comes out of the sea as a symbol for Rome. Um, and so uh, this, this beast, the book of Revelation tells us, is going to be defeated by God, just as Rome will be defeated by God. And Israel and the people of Israel, the early Christians are seeing themselves as part of that story, um, will be... Uh, successful in getting their land back and acknowledging their real king and the real emperor of the cosmos, who is not the Roman king or Roman emperor, but is rather the God of Israel. And this is incredibly interesting and fascinating because the New Testament writers identify, as we've seen, Jesus as the descendant of David. And so they see that he will one day rule over God's kingdom in the second coming. And the idea here is that uh, God's kingdom in the ways that the New Testament writers are talking about it is wonderfully and amazingly subversive uh, because during the period that the New Testament was written, Rome controls Israel. And when people heard the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, they would be hearing the Greek word basileia. Basileia means kingdom or empire. But in that time period, in the first century CE, it almost exclusively referred to the Roman Empire. And so as people are hearing this language, as people are hearing the early Christian writers talk about the kingdom of God, the Basileia of God, um, they're hearing sort of a pot shot at Rome because the, the Christian authors of the New Testament are saying, no, Rome is not really the empire. God's universe is the real empire. And the emperor of Rome is not in charge of things, even though you all might see him as father or sometimes even as divine father of your kingdom. God is the only real father of um, not just our kingdom, but in fact, the entire world and the entire cosmos. And so by invoking this language of Basileia, of um, kingdom, they are uh, taking Rome's own language and subverting it and using it for their own understanding of who is really in charge and who really holds all of the power, not the Romans, but rather the God of Israel. So what can we say about all of these things? The kingdom of heaven, of God, of empire, apocalypticism, resurrection. The New Testament authors, as we've seen, discuss the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God in a number of ways. But I think perhaps what is most helpful to, to emphasize during Lent is how many New Testament texts are focusing on the ways that the people in that time period in their time period, in the there and then, should be conduits of all of the positive elements associated with God's kingdom. Peace, justice, taking care of the poor, loving your neighbor. 
In other words, the New Testament's many threads that are related to the coming kingdom show us how the earliest Christians connected death and their promise of resurrection to hope, but also did not let go of hope for making this earth better while they were waiting. Their actions towards each other and towards others could, in their best manifestations, illustrate what the eternal kingdom would be like, could be like, if it were here on earth. And so there was hope for these early Christians in eternity, in the coming kingdom of God. But there was also the possibility for hope that was rooted in the present earthly reality. And these two journeys, earthly life and the afterlife, are constructed and construed as eternally connected, as woven together, and they're woven together with hope. This ends our five series, uh, five video series on various issues related to death and the afterlife in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want to thank Pastor Dana for the invitation and for anyone who watched all the way through these. We only scratched the surface of these issues that we've touched. There's so much more that we could say, but I'm grateful for your presence and that you shared your Lenten journey with me. Please stay safe and well. Thanks. Light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has, has not, not overcome, overcome it. <clears throat> An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice! Oh,
great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise. 